All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to day two of our best practices for the preparation, submission, and maintenance of sponsor investigator INDs and IDEs workshops. Um, so today is part two, the investigational device exemption or IDE workshop. Um, this presentation is gonna be broken up into two parts. I'm going to present the first part. My name is Kelly Lindblom. Um, I'm gonna present medical device studies in the IDE. And then my colleague, Sarah Gemberling, will present part two on IDE best practices and additional studies. So just a few housekeeping things again before we get started. Um, this session is being recorded and it's gonna be available on our website after we add closed captioning. And so because of that, we ask any WebEx participants to please do not unmute yourself. Um, we've seen some problems with feedback if you're not muted, so please keep yourself muted. And then our remote participants, if you do have any questions, we ask that you please use the chat feature in WebEx and you can direct the questions to Erica Seeger Johnson, parentheses host, um, please don't send them to the presenter because we're not going to be monitoring the chat while we're presenting. Um, but Erica will interrupt the speakers and make sure that you get your questions answered. And then for everyone here, welcome. Um, if you de do need to exit, please use the doors in the back. We closed the garage door. Um, the restrooms are around the corner to the left if you need to use those during the presentation. We do have a microphone set up. If you would like to ask any questions um, at any time throughout the presentation, feel free to go up to the microphone. If you don't want to stand up or don't feel like you can stand up, you can also raise your hand um, and someone in the back will try to get you a microphone. Um, we just want to make sure that for the recording we're able to hear your question. If you are here to fulfill um, your sponsor investigator training requirements, we ask that you please talk to Audrey and Susan at the sign-in table to make sure that we know you're here for that purpose and so we can make sure to give you credit. Um, so if you think there's any chance that you might do a medical device study in the future and you might need that credit, um, just go ahead and let them know so that we can make sure you get that credit. And then we also ask that you please take a few minutes at the end of the presentation to complete the evaluation handed to you at sign-in. Um, we wanna continue to improve these workshops to make them useful for you, so your feedback is very helpful. Okay, so here's just an overview of the Office of Regulatory Affairs and Quality. Um, we used to be known as DTMI Regulatory Affairs, so if you've heard that in the past, um, please know that this is the same office. Um, Right now, um, Amanda Parrish is our director. She's in the back, she's here today. Um, and we also have uh, most of our office's participants here. Um, so we're also building out the quality section of our office. You're good, I'm just gonna try to turn it off a little bit. Okay. Um, so unfortunately not pictured is Dan Ozaki. He is our first kind of quality staff member in the Office of Regulatory Affairs and Quality. He just had his headshot taken yesterday, so we couldn't put it up here. Um, but we are working on building out that quality side of our office. And so we are a free resource um, to the Duke community. So if you ever want our assistance in, um, you know, just as a consultant or in the preparation of an IDE or maintenance, um, please feel free to contact us. So you can visit our website to learn more about our office. And we also have a general inbox listed here. Um, so if you're ever not sure who to reach out to and you have questions, um, please contact us through this inbox. And I also want to introduce REGARD. So this presentation is being brought to you in collaboration with REGARD, which stands for the Regulatory Guidance for Academic Research of Drugs and Devices. And so this is a group comprised of regulatory specialists, regulatory affairs specialists from different North Carolina institutions who received the CTSA grant from NIH. And so that includes UNC and RTI, which make up NC tracks. It also includes Wake Forest and then, of course, us here at Duke. And so our mission as a group is to really work together, you know, gain knowledge from each other, and also to provide researchers with the tools and resources that they need um, to really translate their research and make an impact. And so we have a lot of great information um, on our website. I encourage you to visit it. It's regard.org listed here at the bottom. Um, so you can find a lot of helpful information there. And if you are participating remotely via WebEx and you're from one of these other um, institutions, UNC, RTI, or Wake Forest, I want to make sure that you're aware that you do also have regulatory contacts at your institutions. I've listed them here. Um, so these are the guys we work with as part of the REGARD group. So feel free to contact them as well. All right, so now we're gonna get into the presentation. Um, as I mentioned, part one is about medical device studies in the IDE. So here's an outline of the talk. First, we're gonna go over definitions, and I'm gonna give a brief overview of marketing medical devices. Then we're gonna talk about pre-submission meetings with the FDA. 
We'll also talk about clinical investigations of a medical device, how you can be exempt from the IDE regulations, and then significant risk and non-significant risk determinations and the IDE. And so first we'll go over those definitions. And so what is a medical device? That's important to know for this presentation. So according to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, a medical device is an instrument, apparatus, implement, machine, contrivance, implant, in vitro reagent, or other similar or related article or component part or accessory. So it can basically be anything. So it's one of these things that is intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. Or it's one of these things that is intended to affect the structure or any function of the body. Um, so show of hands, who participated in the IND workshop yesterday? Okay, so almost everyone. Um, so hopefully this definition looks pretty familiar to you. Um, up until this point, the definition of a medical device is very similar to the definition of a drug. Um, but then we have this other important part of the definition listed here in red. So importantly, a medical device does not achieve any of its primary intended purposes through chemical action within or on the body of man or other animals, and it's not going to be dependent upon being metabolized in order to achieve any of those primary intended purposes. Um, so sometimes we like to think of this as medical devices using physical or mechanical force um, in order to achieve their primary intended effect. So you could think of a stent. Um, it uses mechanical force to really keep the artery open to allow blood flow, um, so it's not using chemical action in order to achieve that primary intended purpose. I also want to point out that it can't use chemical action, a medical device, within or on the body of man or other animals, so it can use chemical action outside the body, and so we'll talk a little bit more later about in vitro diagnostic devices. Um, this would be something like a urine pregnancy test, which you'll see on the next slide, and so a urine pregnancy test does use chemical action to detect hormones in the urine. Um, however, since this is outside the body, it's still considered a medical device. And so here's some other examples of medical devices. Um, as you can see, they are very heterogeneous in terms of both their complexity and their risk. So FDA does oversee things as simple as floss or a toothbrush or polarized sunglasses. And then all the way up to things that are really complex like an MRI machine or implantable pacemaker. Um, there's also that in vitro diagnostic I talked about, the pregnancy test. And then also, um, there are combination products, so this is when there is a combination of both a drug and a device, a biologic and a device, um, or maybe a drug and a biologic. And so we have this example here of an asthma inhaler. This is a combination product. And so there's the actual asthma medicine, which would be a drug, and then the medication delivery device um, would be considered a device. And so combination products are regulated by their primary mode of action. Um, in this case, it actually would likely be the drug component. That's the primary mode of action. Um, and so that might be regulated as a drug. Okay, so who oversees medical devices? Well, for the most part, it's the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH, um, at the FDA. And so they oversee most medical devices. Um, there is an exception for medical devices that are used to safeguard blood and blood components um, and other cellular products. However, um, most medical devices are regulated by CDRH. They also oversee radiation emitting products, um, so not necessarily just medical radiation emitting products, but also non-medical ones. So things like lasers, ultrasound equipment, um, microwave or tanning bed. And then they also see those oversee those combination products when the primary mode of action is the device component. Um, so for example, I gave the example of a stent before as a medical device, so there are also drug eluding stents. Um, so in that case, even though there are both drug and device components, a drug eluding stent is actually overseen by CDRH um, because FDA decided that the stent portion is really the primary mode of action and it's a device. So believe it or not, uh, medical devices were not reviewed by FDA before going to market until 1976, um, so that's pretty recent. And this came with the medical device amendments of 1976. And so before that, investigational devices weren't reviewed or they were reviewed as drugs. But these medical device amendments establish device classifications based on risk, um, which we'll talk about on the next slide. And the amendments also establish the investigational device exemption, um, which will be a big focus of the talk. 
Okay, so with these medical device amendments, FDA established three regulatory classes of devices based on the level of control that they felt was necessary to assure proper safety and effectiveness of these devices. And so the first class is class one. These are really those low risk devices, things like a toothbrush, sunglasses, dental floss. And so in this case, FDA thought that what's known as general controls are sufficient in order to assure safety and effectiveness of these low risk medical devices. And so we'll talk on the next slide about what general controls means. The second regulatory class are those class two devices. These are the more moderate risk devices, things like an MRI or a powered wheelchair. And in this case, FDA does not feel that general controls are sufficient in order to uh, assure safety and effectiveness. And so they also added another requirement, which is following special controls. And we'll talk about what special controls are as well. And then lastly, class three are gonna be those really high risk devices, um, things that are really important to keep a patient alive or are really important for diagnosing a condition. Um, so that would be things like an external defibrillator or a replacement heart valve. And in this case, general and special controls are not sufficient. Um, and so in addition to general controls, class three devices have to um, have pre-market approval before these devices go on the market since they're so high risk. Okay, so what are general controls? So as I mentioned, these are required for all medical devices, class one, two, and three. And so the first general control is that you have to register your establishment. So if you're a device firm um, and you're marketing medical devices every year, you have to register your establishment with FDA. You also every year have to list all of the medical devices that are currently in circulation. Um, so together that's known as registration and listing. You also have to manufacture your medical devices in accordance with the quality system regulation, or QSR. So if you're familiar with good manufacturing practices for drugs, this is basically the equivalent for medical devices. Um, so this is making sure that your device is being manufactured according to protocols. You have to have some quality oversight to make sure you know, the protocols are being followed um, and that you're doing all the necessary testing to make sure that your device is safe and functioning properly. You also have to um, follow certain labeling requirements. Um, and so most medical devices need to be labeled with instructions for use, although you can be exempt from this requirement. Um, and you also don't wanna have any misleading statements on your labeling. So if you haven't demonstrated that your medical device can do something, you can't put that on the label. You also have to comply with medical device reporting requirements. So if you learn that there's been a failure of your device or there's been some kind of serious adverse event um, from people using your device, you need to let FDA know about that. You also have to submit a pre-market notification or a 510K before putting your device on the market. Um, however, you can be exempt from this requirement and we'll talk more about that later. And then lastly, you have to follow the regulations for investigational device exemption, um, and we'll also talk about that more later. Okay, so special controls, as I mentioned, are specifically for class two medical devices. And these are really a lot more tailored to the actual device that you're developing. Um, so usually one of the special controls is that there are some certain performance standards. So if you're developing a blood pressure cuff, um, there's gonna be certain testing that you need to do in order to ensure that that blood pressure cuff can actually accurately measure blood pressure. Um, you might also be subject to post-market surveillance studies. Um, this is usually just for when the device failure would be serious or your device is being used in a pediatric population or it's an implant or something like that. Um, so that's not always a requirement. Um, sometimes there's also a requirement to keep patient registry so you can track outcome data. Um, and then there's also potentially some special labeling requirements, other pre-market data requirements. So as I said, this is really gonna be dictated by the actual device that you're developing. Okay, and then lastly, for class three medical devices, um, all new class three medical devices need to get pre-market approval before going on the market. And so this is really an independent review by FDA to make sure that this device is safe and effective. This is the most stringent type of marketing application. Um, it's often compared to an NDA or a BLA for drugs. And so basically, just because of how risky class three devices are, as I said, FDA doesn't think that general and special controls are sufficient, so you really need to um, prove that it's safe and effective with this PMA application. And so there's three major commercialization options. Um, the class one, two, and three devices don't fit neatly into these categories, but they almost do. Um, so most class one devices, about 95%, and a few class two devices, about 9%, 
are actually exempt from the 510K regulations. Um, so I mentioned that as part of general controls, it's a requirement to submit a pre-market notification or a 510K before putting your device on the market. However, most class one and some class two devices are exempt from that requirement. And so the next option is to go ahead and submit that pre-market notification or 510K. And so this is kind of an interesting mechanism. Um, we'll talk about this in more in detail, but basically with a 510K, you're telling FDA that your device is at least as safe and effective or substantially equivalent to another legally marketed device um, that's already on the market and not subject to a PMA. So a 510K has a 90-day review period. And then lastly, that pre-market approval mechanism that we talked about that's required for all new class three devices. Um, and again, that's really the rigorous review to make sure that the device is safe and effective. And it's an independent review, so you're not comparing your device to any other device that's on the market. And so I want to point out that clinical studies aren't necessarily required before you market a medical device. Um, so that's a lot different than drugs if you're developing a brand new drug. Um, so clinical studies are not likely to be required if you're using the exempt commercialization option. Um, it makes sense, right? If you don't even need to tell FDA that you're going to be putting this device on the market, um, it's unlikely you're going to need clinical data. Sometimes you'll need clinical data for a 510K, so it might be required um, when you're trying to show that your device is just as safe and effective as another device, and might, you might need clinical data in order to back that up. And then it's almost always going to be required if you're submitting a PMA that you do clinical studies. Um, again, you, this is really a rigorous application, and you need to prove to FDA that your device is safe and effective, usually with clinical studies. Okay, so you might be wondering, how do you know which class your device is, and how do you know which commercialization path to follow, since it's not really that straightforward? Well, in addition to classifying devices as class one, two, and three, FDA also groups medical devices according to medical specialty, and so you can find this within the Code of Federal Regulations. So they classify them according to medical specialty into 16 groups that are listed here, um, and then within each of these groups, there's also subcategories, um, which we'll take a closer look at. So if you click on 870, cardiovascular devices, um, in subpart D, they list all cardiovascular prosthetic devices. Um, so they kind of have generic device classifications, and if your device fits into one of these categories, um, that's how it's going to be regulated. So we'll take a closer look at some cardiovascular prosthetic devices. So first, here we have a prosthetic heart valve sizer. So you can see, first, they have a description or an identification of what that device is. So they say a prosthetic heart valve sizer is a device used to measure the size of the natural valve opening to determine the size of the appropriate replacement heart valve. So if that's what your device does, then you fit into this classification regulation. And then underneath, they also tell you what class this device is. So they say this is a class one device. It's one of those low risk devices. And so you're just subject to general controls. And then they also follow this by saying that this device is exempt from pre-market notification procedures. So you don't have to submit that 510K before putting a prosthetic heart valve sizer on the market. So next, we'll look at an example of a class two device, a vascular graft prosthesis. So you can see here the definition or identification is a bit longer. Um, it's also a bit more detailed. So for example, at the end, they say that the graft structure itself cannot be made of materials of animal origin. Um, so if your vascular graft prosthesis was made out of animal materials, um, it wouldn't fit into this category. And then again, they list the class. So this is a class two device, and they say that it's subject to special controls. And then you can see here that they say the special control for this device is the FDA guidance document entitled Guidance Document for Vascular, Vascular Prosthesis 510K Submissions. So let's take a look at that. Um, so I just provided a screenshot here, but if you're interested, I also have a link in the bottom if you want to look at it in more detail. And so this guy's guidance document really explains all of the risks of this type of device and then the necessary risk mitigation strategies in order to make sure that your device is at least safe and effective enough to go on the market. Um, so for example, here they ha identify one of the risks of this device as leakage. And then in the control column, they say that you should conduct all the appropriate tests um, to make sure that there's not going to be a leak in your device. So these would be tests to look at porosity, water permeability, et cetera. 
Um, another risk would be biocompatibility. So you might need to address biocompatibility by doing some testing. Um, there's also maybe some labeling requirements that can help make sure that um, you know someone's not going to have an allergic reaction to your device. And so if you're developing a device that's you know pretty common um, and well understood by FDA, chances are they might have a guidance document that really outlines what you need to do um, before putting that device to the market. And so lastly, we have an example of a class three device. Um, again, still one of these cardiovascular prosthetic devices. So this is a replacement heart valve. Um, so again, they tell you what the device is, and then they say that it's a class three device, and you need pre-market approval before putting this device on the market. Um, so I think it's less likely with class three devices that there's going to be a guidance document um, that's going to tell you exactly what to do. However, sometimes there is. Um, there might also be some standards that you can follow to test your device. But overall, this is going to be a really stringent uh, marketing application. And so I also want to point out that FDA has a number of medical device databases that can be very useful um, if you are studying or developing a medical device. So sometimes by just looking at those classification regulations, it can be hard to figure out which one your device fits into. And so here I have a screenshot of the 510K database, but I've also highlighted in red some other ones on the right side. Um, so there's a device classification database, a PMA database. Uh, there's also a registration and listing database, which could be helpful. So if you're aware of a device, that's similar to your device or similar to part of your device, um, it can be helpful to look it up either by the company name or the device name, um, and then you might have a better idea of kind of what class your device is and which commercialization path you might need to follow. Okay, so before I move on to talking about the 510K process in a little bit more detail, does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, great. Okay, so now we'll talk about the 510K process in a little bit more detail. This is really um, the most common review process that FDA uses before most devices go on the market. Um, so only about 10% of medical devices are class three devices, whereas about 43% are class two and 47% are class one. Um, so a lot of those class one devices are exempt. So this is really the main mechanism they use to review most medical devices before they go on the market. And so it's actually not an approval mechanism, but it's a clearance mechanism. So FDA doesn't approve 510Ks. And as I mentioned earlier, it allows you, FDA to determine substantial equivalence of your device. So you need to prove to FDA that your device that you're developing, compared to a predicate device, has both the same intended use and it either has the same technological characteristics as that predicate device or any differences in technological characteristics do not raise new questions of safety or effectiveness. Um, so let's break down all these parts to make sure we understand them. Okay, so first of all, what is a predicate device? So a predicate device is a legally marketed class one or two device that's used for comparison to your device in order to determine substantial equivalence. Um, so as I mentioned, you're trying to demonstrate to FDA that the device that you're developing is just as safe and effective as a device that's already on the market. So they have already reviewed this other device. They've already determined that it's safe and effective enough to be on the market. So you're just kind of saying, me too. I'm just like them, um, so I'm also safe and effective. And so this can be a little bit confusing or not that intuitive, um, especially to an academic research audience, because usually you're used to saying in a grant application, um, you know, my device is so novel, it's really going to do all these new things and change the field and everything like that. Um, but this is much different. You really want to say my device is just like this other device. Um, so FDA doesn't want your device to be novel. Okay, so what does intended use mean? So I mentioned that your device has to have the same intended use as that predicate device. And so intended use means the general purpose of the device or its function, and it encompasses the indications for use. Um, so the indications for use describe the disease or condition that the device will diagnose, treat, prevent, cure, or mitigate. And this also includes the patient population. Um, so your device doesn't necessarily have to treat the same patient population as your predicate device, but it has to have the same overall function as the predicate device. So let's look at some examples. Um, so say you're developing an assay to detect infection in adults. Um, you might be able to use another assay that's already on the market that detects H. pylori infection in children. Um, so here, the patient population is changing. Um, however, the assay is still kind of doing the same thing. So that would be an appropriate predicate device. However, um, an example where there's a different intended use would be if you're trying to develop a laser ablation system to treat epilepsy 
whereas kind of the only thing that's on the market right now is a laser ablation system to kill tumor cells. Um, so in this case, there might not be studies that have been done to demonstrate that, you know, this laser ablation system is safe and effective at treating epilepsy. It's only been proven that it's safe and effective at killing tumor cells. So that's a different intended use, um, and it probably wouldn't be a suitable predicate. So does that make sense to everybody? All right, and so your device also has to have either the same technological characteristics or any differences can't raise new questions of safety and effectiveness. And so technological characteristics include things like the design, the materials, the chemical composition, the energy source of your device. And I also want to point out that you can potentially have a reference device in addition to a predicate device. So a reference device is going to be a device that doesn't necessarily have the same intended use as your device, so it's not an appropriate predicate, but it does have similar technological characteristics. And this can be helpful because you can use these technological characteristics and the testing that this other device did um, in order to mitigate those risks in support of your device. So for example, say you're developing a knee implant and the knee implant that you're using as a predicate device has a different coating on the outside than the knee implant that you're developing. However, you're aware of a hip implant that does have the same coating as your knee implant. So you could use that hip implant, even though it has a different intended use, and you can say they did X, Y, and Z tests on this coating to make sure that it's safe and you know is a good barrier, et cetera. Um, and so you could use that testing in support of your application. All right, so here's just a summary of the 510K process, what we just went over. Um, again, it's a clearance and not an approval mechanism. It also allows FDA to determine substantial equivalence. So you're telling them that your device is just as safe and effective as another device that's already on the market that has the same intended use. All right, so what if you're developing a device that is novel, but it's not necessarily high risk? So up until 1997, all novel devices where there wasn't a predicate were automatically class three. Um, even if they weren't risky, if there wasn't something that was already on the market like it, then it was automatically class three, and you had to submit that PMA. But with the FDA Moderniza Modernization Act in 1997, they established this de novo process. So the de novo process provides a pathway for class one and class two, those low and moderate risk devices, um, to really go on the market and develop general and special controls along with FDA um, instead of submitting that PMA. Since there's no predicate, they can't use the 510K, um, but they're going to work with FDA in order to use this de novo pathway. So you can use the de novo process either right from the start, or you can use it after FDA has determined that your device is not substantially equivalent to another device in the 510K process. Um, initially, you could only use this pathway if they gave you that not, uh, not substantially equivalent determination, but then they opened it up as well. And so as I mentioned, you really work with FDA and you need to have a good understanding of all of the risks and benefits of your medical device because you're going to come up with those general and special controls. So you need to identify how device risks are going to be mitigated. You need to explain how device effectiveness is going to be assured using those general and special controls. Um, and this has a little bit longer of a review process than a 510K, so this is a 120-day review process. Um, and that makes sense since you're really kind of coming up with a lot of this stuff from scratch. And so an example you might be familiar with, um, it's, it was reported in the media that 23andMe used the de novo pathway in order to market their recent um, direct-to-consumer genetic risk testing. And so this testing doesn't tell you your overall risk of developing a disease. It doesn't make a diagnosis. And so FDA felt that it wasn't you know, class three and that class two was appropriate for these tests. And so 23andMe and the FDA worked together to come up with those general and special controls um, to make sure that they were mitigating all of the risks of that test. Um, so they came up with special controls about how to deal with false negatives or false positives. Um, they also made sure that those tests were really easy to interpret by the user, um, things like that. And so that's an example of someone that recently used the Genova pathway. All right, do we have any questions on marketing before I move to pre-submission meetings? Not on WebEx. All right, great. All right, so a pre-submission meeting is part of the QSUB program. Um, so the QSUB program is a program that's part of CDRH where you can gain feedback from FDA um, on a number of different topics. The pre-sub specifically is defined as a formal written request from an applicant for feedback from FDA 
to be provided either just as written responses or in the form of a teleconference or an in-person meeting. Um, you get to choose which one of these you want to request. Um, they might not necessarily uh, say yes to your request, but you can request it. And so this can be utilized for a wide range of questions during device development. So for example, if you're planning to use that 510K pathway I talked about, you could ask FDA in a pre-sub, is this an appropriate predicate device to use? Um, you could also ask, is my planned non-clinical testing appropriate, or do I have enough data to support marketing application? Um, you can also use it if you're just planning a clinical study, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, but you could ask for feedback on your protocol, or um, you know, if you have enough preclinical data to go into a first in man study. Um, so it could be used for a wide range of questions. And this meeting will be held 75 to 90 days after the request is received by FDA. So you do have to wait a little bit of time to have this meeting, um, but it's very useful. And we highly recommend that you have one of these if you're thinking about developing a device or doing a device study. And so I have a link to the Q submission guidance. If you want to know more, I highly recommend that you read that, but we'll talk about it in a little bit more detail as well. And so we mentioned this is a mechanism to obtain feedback from FDA on either device development or potentially your clinical protocol. And if you were here yesterday, this is very similar to the pre-IND meeting for drugs or biologics. And what you do is you send FDA a written submission that importantly includes your questions, but then it also includes a lot of background information on your device. So a device description, how you're planning on using that device. Um, if you have a clinical protocol, you can include that or just your development plan. Um, and then again, as I said, questions. And so a pre-sub is not required by FDA, but it is encouraged by them as well as by our office. And you can use it even if you're not planning to do a clinical study. So the pre-sub meeting used to be referred to as the pre-IDE meeting, but that confused people because they thought they could only have one if they were gonna have an IDE, um, which you need for a significant risk device study, which we'll talk about. Um, but then they changed the name because they wanted to encourage um, people in all stages of development to utilize this mechanism. And unlike a pre-IND meeting, you can actually have a pre-sub more than once. Um, so it's different than that formal meeting schedule in drug development, and you can have as many pre-sub meetings as you want. Um, so it's not recommended, or you're not supposed to ask the same questions at different pre-sub meetings, um, but you could have a pre-sub meeting early in development when you're just planning your non-clinical studies. You could have another one to go over your clinical protocol, um, another one to make sure you have enough data for a marketing application, et cetera. Um, so you can have as many as you want. And this is because I think CDRH and FDA understands that medical device development is very complex. Um, it's not really as straightforward as developing drugs, so they wanna encourage working together. And so similar to a pre-IND meeting, you have to submit um, this package that I talked about. And this actually goes in at the same time as the meeting request, um, unlike the pre-IND meeting where you first send the request and then you send this briefing package um, 30 days before the meeting. For a pre-sub, you just go ahead and submit all of it right away. And so usually you would include a cover letter, a table of contents, you would include a device description. And so this seems pretty straightforward, um, but FDA, gives feedback a lot of times that the device descriptions are really hard to understand. So if you've been working on your device for years, decades, you know, you're really involved in the device and sometimes it can be hard to explain it to other people. Um, so this is an example of a time where our office would be happy to help you. Um, we can make sure that your device description makes sense. You would also again include that proposed intended use, any previous discussions or submissions that you've had with FDA. Um, so maybe there's some reviewers that have already, you know, looked at your project or you've already communicated with, um, you might want them to be involved in this meeting as well. So you can really establish that relationship and it's also a more efficient review process. Um, you would explain your product development status. Um, again, specific questions. And so similar to the pre-IND meeting, we really recommend that your questions are not open-ended. Um, so you wouldn't ask FDA, you know, what should my clinical protocol design look like or what testing do I need to do? But instead you would propose what you think needs to be done. Um, usually re we recommend that this is kind of the best case scenario for you. Um, and then you would ask FDA if they agree that that's sufficient. Um, and hopefully they'll say yes, but if they say no, they'll explain why. You also will include how you want that feedback. So again, this can be uh, just written responses or it can be a teleconference or an in-person meeting. And so if you do request a teleconference teleconference or an in-person meeting, you'll also get written responses about a day before. Um, so we usually recommend that you at least request a teleconference because um, you can always cancel it if they've sufficiently answered your questions in that written feedback. 
And then you'll also include any other logistical information. So if you're requesting a teleconference, maybe your teleconference line number or what days of the week work best for you, things like that. All right, do we have any questions on pre-sub meetings before we move on? Uh, Audrey is going to hand you a microphone. Sorry, I can't hear you. My question is uh, whether the applicant should pay for these meetings. There's some kind of fee. Do you have to pay for this pre-sub meeting? Nope, they're free. Thank you. All right, great. Yes, sorry, I did not mention that. That is a big benefit of a pre-sub meeting is that they are free. All right, so now we're going to move on to clinical investigations of a medical device. So what is a clinical investigation? Well, a clinical investigation is any experiment in which a drug, or in this case we're talking about a device, is administered, dispensed to, or used involving one or more human subjects, except for the use of a marketed product in the course of medical practice. So FDA does not regulate the practice of medicine. A clinician is able to use an approved device in any way they want, even if it's off-label. Um, so we're only talking here about clinical studies where a subject is assigned to a specific intervention according to a study protocol. So who conducts a clinical investigation? This might be a review if you were here yesterday, um, but just to make sure you understand. A sponsor is the individual, company, academic institution, or other organization that's really initiating the clinical investigation and taking responsibility for it. Um, so the regulatory sponsor is different than the financial sponsor. Usually people think of the sponsor as the funding source, um, but for FDA, the sponsor is really the one who's responsible for that investigation. On the other hand, the investigator is the one who's actually conducting the clinical investigation. Um, so this is the person who's under immediate direction the device is being used. And it's very common at places like Duke and other academic institutions that we have sponsor investigators. So this is when an individual both initiates and conducts that clinical investigation, um, and they're gonna be the one under whose immediate direction the device is used. <coughs> And so this is one of the most important slides of my part of the presentation. When is a clinical investigation a device study? Well, if the objective of the clinical investigation is to assess the safety or effectiveness of a medical device, then the study is a device study and it's subject to regulatory oversight by the FDA. Um, so this means that the investigational device exemption requirements apply. So what is the investigational device exemption or the IDE? So an IDE is a regulatory submission to FDA that permits the clinical investigation of devices. So this is very similar to an IND for drugs. And if you submit this IDE to FDA and it's approved by them, then the IDE allows you to use an investigational device in a clinical study in order to collect safety and effectiveness information. And it also allows you to ship the device lawfully for the purposes of conducting a clinical investigation. Um, so usually it would be in violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act um, to ship an investigational device because you haven't met those marketing requirements um, that you need to before shipping a device across state lines. Um, but this exempts you from those requirements, which is why it's called the investigational device exemption. All right, so I have a question for everyone. Are all clinical investigations that use medical devices subject to regulatory oversight by FDA? What do you guys think? I see some heads shaking, no. So that's correct. So as I mentioned before, if the objective of the study is not explicitly to test the safety or effectiveness of a medical device, um, then the study would not fall within the scope of the IDE regulations and 21 CFR 812. And so we like to think of this as when devices are being used as tools. And so, for example, say you're developing a weight loss drug. Um, obviously, as part of your study, you're going to want to measure the weight of patients, and you could use a stand-on patient scale to measure weight. And so, in this scenario, you're not necessarily testing that stand-on patient scale. Even though it's a medical device, you're not testing whether that scale is safe or effective. So that would just be a tool in the study, um, and that study would not fall within the scope of 21 CFR 812. And so that scale doesn't even necessarily need to be an FDA approved or cleared scale. Um, it could be one you made in your research lab, but if you're not testing that scale, um, then it does not fall within the scope of 812. Does that make sense to everybody? Great. Okay, so if you decide that you are a device study and the objective is to study is to assess the safety or effectiveness of your device, there's three different options. So the first option is that you can be exempt from the IDE regulations. And then the second and third option are having an approved IDE. Um, so that comes in two different types. You can either have an abbreviated IDE or a full IDE. 
Okay, so next we'll talk about how you can be exempt from the IDE regulations. Okay, so in order to be exempt from the IDE regulations, um, one of the following needs to apply. So you could be using a legally marketed device in accordance with its labeling. And so in this case, since the device is legally marketed, FDA has already um, reviewed this device. They've already said that it's safe and effective for its intended use. So if you're using the device just how it was approved, um, then that's fine. They don't need to review that study again. You could also be a diagnostic device that meets four specific criteria. And we're gonna talk about those diagnostic device exemption criteria in a few slides. You could also be a device that's undergoing consumer preference testing, testing of a modification, or testing of a combination of two or more devices in commercial distribution, as long as all of this testing is not testing safety and effectiveness of the devices, and it's not putting subjects at risk. Um, so for example, say you work for a company that's making one of those kits that EMT carry, EMTs carry around. Um, it's gonna have a lot of different tools and medical devices within the kit, uh, but you're just looking at how the devices are oriented, maybe where the strap is, so that they can get easy access to those devices. In that case, you're not testing safety or effectiveness of the actual medical devices. It's just consumer preference testing. So you wouldn't need an IDE to test, to test a kit like that in a study. Also, if your device is just intended for veterinary use, you're exempt from the IDE regulations. Or similarly, if your device is for research on or with laboratory animals. And then lastly, if you have a custom device, you're also exempt from the IDE regulations. And so custom devices have very specific requirements around them. So custom devices are not generally available. They're usually made specifically to accommodate a certain physician or a dentist. And you can't be using this device in more than five patient cases per year. Um, and there's also some annual reporting requirements that go along with a custom device. So it's usually pretty rare that someone, um, especially at a place like Duke, is developing a custom device. And there are other requirements. Um, and if you want more information, we have a link to a guidance document about custom devices. All right, so I'm gonna make a quick segue to talk about in vitro diagnostic devices before we talk about that diagnostic exemption criteria. So in vitro diagnostics, or IVDs, are those reagents, instruments, and systems intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. As I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the definition of a medical device, um, they're different than kind of classic medical devices because they don't function in or on a patient. And instead, they're really intended for use in the collection preparation and examination of specimens taken from the human body. So this could include things like blood, spinal fluid, tissue samples, serum, or urine. Um, so something like that urine pregnancy test or maybe um, a tumor DNA sequencing assay, something like that. And so it's really important to know that the FDA considers the in vitro diagnostic or IVD to be the entire process from specimen collection to results reporting. So they consider the IVD to be specimen collection and transport, specimen preparation, specimen examination and analysis, and then the method of calculating and reporting the result. Um, so there can be risks kind of with each stage. So say you're not um, transporting the sample appropriately, maybe that's gonna affect the validity of your test, or maybe it's using kind of a risky um, collection procedure. There's kind of risk involved with all of these that can affect um, the safety of patients. So all of this is considered the IVD and not just that test that you're doing back in the lab. All right, so let's talk about the diagnostic device exemption criteria. And I do wanna point out that IVDs fall into this as well as other diagnostic devices. Um, so something like an MRI or a blood pressure cuff is also considered a diagnostic device. It's not just IVDs. And so a diagnostic device study can be IDE exempt if the testing meets all four of these criteria. So the first one is that the testing is non-invasive, does not require invasive sampling procedure that presents significant risk, does not by design or intention introduce energy into a subject, or is not used as a diagnostic procedure without confirmation of the diagnosis by another medically established diagnostic product or procedure. And so FDA has a guidance document on frequently asked questions for in vitro diagnostics where they explain three of these four requirements in a little bit more detail. Um, so we'll go over those. But I do wanna point out that they do not explain this third criteria, which is that the device testing does not by design or intention introduce energy into subjects. And that's because this is pretty straightforward and any type of energy counts. So this could be heat energy, light, radiation. If the testing is introducing any type of energy, then you can't be exempt. 
Okay, so first they ask, when is a diagnostic device non-invasive? So FDA explains that to them, a non-invasive device is one that does not, by design or intention, penetrate or pierce the skin or mucous membranes of the body, the ocular cavity, or the urethra, or enter the ear beyond the external auditory canal, the nose beyond the nares, the mouth beyond the pharynx, the anal canal beyond the rectum, or the vagina beyond the cervix. Um, so if your device does any of these things, then it's not considered non-invasive. Um, and I have a link to that guidance document in the corner of all these slides if you want to learn more. So they also explain what they mean by when an invasive sampling procedure presents significant risk. This can be a little bit more subjective or a little bit more of a gray area. So they recommend that you base your risk determination on the nature of harm that could result from the sampling. So FDA considers sampling techniques that require a biopsy of a major organ, use of general anesthesia, or placement of a blood access line into an artery or a large vein to present significant risk. And they also note, importantly, here at the bottom, that they do not consider blood sampling using simple venipuncture to be invasive. So they consider this non-invasive. And so even though it's piercing the skin, um, as we talked about on the last slide, since it's such a routine and safe procedure, they do consider it non-invasive. And then importantly, they also consider surplus samples or body of body fluids or tissues that are left over from samples taken for non-investigational purposes to be considered non-invasive. So if you're going in to get a tumor biopsy for clinical care and there happens to be some sample left over, um, you could use that in a research study and it wouldn't be considered significant risk sampling regardless of how that sample was taken. However, if you're going in to get that tumor biopsy and they're gonna take some extra samples just for research purposes, um, in that case, you do have to assess whether that sampling procedure is presenting significant risk. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and then we're skipping over that energy one since all energy counts. And then they say, what does confirmation by another medically established product or procedure mean? So they say that the test results of your diagnostic should not influence patient treatment or clinical management decisions before the diagnosis is established by a medically established product or procedure, or sorry, confirmed. Um, so if your test is so novel or new that there really isn't anything out there that can confirm the test, then you just can't be exempt. So they give the example that if you're trying to detect infection um, using an assay that detects infection before antibodies are formed, but the only thing that's out there on the market right now are tests that you know, look at antibodies in order to detect the infection, then you just can't be exempt because there's no appropriate product on the market that's able to really confirm that diagnosis um, and so you can't be exempt. Okay, so just as a review, if you have a diagnostic device study, you can be exempt from the IDE regulations if the device is non-invasive, if the testing does not require an invasive sampling procedure that presents significant risk, if it does not by design or intention introduce energy into subjects, and if you're not using this diagnostic as a diagnostic procedure without confirming that diagnosis by another medically established product or procedure. So do we have any questions about exemptions before I move on to significant risk and non-significant risk device studies? Okay. Okay, so I mentioned there's kind of three options if you do have a device study. So if you're not exempt, then you have to have an approved IDE. So this can either be an abbreviated IDE or it can be a full IDE. So what's the difference between an abbreviated and a full IDE? Well, there's a number of differences, but one of the differences is who is overseeing the study. So for an abbreviated IDE, only the IRB is gonna be overseeing that study, and that would be in cases where the study is a non-significant risk device study. Whereas both the FDA and the IRB oversee those full IDE studies, and that's gonna be when the study is a significant risk device study. So what's a significant risk device study? <laughs> FDA doesn't actually have a definition for a significant risk device study, but they do define a significant risk device. And so a significant risk device is one that is intended as an implant and presents a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, and welfare of a subject. It could be used to support or sustain human life. It's of substantial importance in diagnosing, curing, mitigating, or treating disease, or otherwise preventing impairment of human health, or kind of this catch-all at the bottom, which is that it does not otherwise present, or it does otherwise present a potential for serious risk to the health, safety, and welfare of a subject. And so I want to say again and point out that the study risk determination is not necessarily based on just the device, but it's how the device is being used in the study. So it's possible that there are 
is one device that's being used in two studies in two different ways, but one of those studies is gonna be non-significant risk device study, and one is gonna be a significant risk device study. Um, so for example, if you're developing an ultrasound device, you could be using that in one study to monitor healthy pregnancies, or maybe you're doing a lot of other testing, you know, using other devices to monitor that pregnancy. And so that could potentially be a non-significant risk device study, um, depending on the other details of the study. But say you also want to use that investigational ultrasound for diagnosing liver cancer in another study. Um, so in that case, it's going to be a lot more risky. Maybe you're not confirming the diagnosis in another way. Um, so using the same device, depending on the context, could be non-significant risk or significant risk. And so in order to help um, the IRB and sponsors and investigators decide whether their study is a significant risk device study, the FDA does have a very helpful guidance document, which I have a link to here. Um, but I'll kind of explain the overall process. And so to make this study risk determination, we recommend and FDA recommends that first the sponsor makes a risk assessment. So the sponsor of the study is really going to be the one most qualified to make this assessment. So they're going to know the clinical protocol. They're going to know the device, how that device has been used in the past. Um, they're going to be really familiar with the patient population that they're treating since they probably already treat it. And so we recommend that the sponsor makes a risk assessment and they submit that to the IRB along with their protocol. And so if the sponsor thinks that their device study is a non-significant risk device study and the IRB agrees, then that's great. And you just this study would just require an abbreviated IDE. So as I mentioned before, non-significant risk device studies do not need an IDE application approved by the FDA. And instead, the IRB is really serving as a surrogate for FDA's review and approval and continuing review of these non-significant risk device studies. So non-significant risk device studies do need to follow the abbreviated IDE requirements. So these are the abbreviated IDE requirements. The first one is that you need to label the device properly. So you're going need to need to label the device or the associated documentation with the device um, with maybe the instructions for use. You're also going to have to say that this is an investigational device um, and that it shouldn't be used outside of the study. You also need to obtain and maintain IRB approval. You have to obtain informed consent from all your participants and make sure they know that you're using an investigational device in the study. You have to monitor the study. So that means you have to make sure the study is being conducted according to the protocol. Um, you have to make sure that the data in your study is valid. You have to maintain any required records or reports. And then you also have to comply with prohibitions against promotion. So you can't be advertising your study, saying that it's going to cure cancer, or saying that your device is going to do something that you haven't really proven that it can do yet, um, since it's still investigational. So these are not really burdensome requirements. Sometimes people get nervous or think it's going to be a lot of work to have an abbreviated IDE if these IDE regulations apply. Um, but this is really stuff that you would probably do as part of good clinical practice or that you would have to do um, according to other regulations. OK, so let's go back to that study risk determination. So say the sponsor thinks that their study is a non-significant risk device study, but after they submit that to the IRB, the IRB is not sure. They think it could potentially be a significant risk. Um, so they think that it's best to get FDA input on this study. And so there's two different ways that you can get input from FDA on whether your study is a significant risk or non-significant risk device study. The first way is through that Q submission mechanism that I mentioned before um, when we were talking about the pre-sub. So this type of Q submission is a study risk determination request. And for this study risk determination request, you include a cover letter highlighting this is a study risk determination request. And you also include information about your device and your study protocol. And so usually you'll get a response for a study risk determination request within 60 days. However, one of the drawbacks of this option is that there's really not a defined timeline by which you're going to get a response. We have seen it take longer than 60 days, um, but usually it's within 60 days. Um, and this is going to be a binding determination. So the FDA has the final say in whether or not this is a significant risk or not significant risk device study. Um, their opinion kind of trumps the IRB. And so the other option for getting a study risk determination from FDA is to just go ahead and submit that full IDE. And the benefit of that is that you are going to get a response within 30 days. Um, so Sarah's going to talk more about what goes into an IDE and the IDE review process. Um, but similar to an IND, there's that 30-day review clock. And so you know you're going to get a response. Um, there is going to be a little bit more work since you have to put together a full IDE. And you should know that if your study is a non-significant risk device study and you did submit that full IDE, FDA is not going to just say, well, OK, you already submitted this, so we'll just give you an IDE. 
frankly, that's more work for them because you're going to have to submit, you know, safety reports, annual reports, et cetera. Um, so if your study is non-significant risk, they'll just go ahead and tell you that and you won't need the IDE. Um, but if it is significant risk, then you've kind of already done that work up front. Um, so maybe your IDE will get approved. Okay, and then kind of the third option for the study risk determination is that the sponsor just knows right from the start that their study is a significant risk device study, or they know that it's going to be kind of a gray area. And in this case, they can just go straight to the FDA if they want. They don't necessarily have to get that risk determination first from the IRB. Um, so you would just go ahead and submit that full IDE, and then you would tell the IRB um, after that that FDA hopefully approved your IDE um, and that you're good to go there. Kelly, we have a question on WebEx. Oh, okay. Uh, similar to IND investigator sponsor situations, can there be a single investigator sponsor or sponsor investigator for an IDE? Yes, so you can have a sponsor investigator for an IDE. Okay. So just to summarize what we were talking about um, in this last part of the talk, if you do have a device study, which means you're testing the safety or effectiveness of a device, then you're subject to the IDE requirements. And so you can be exempt from the IDE requirements, and in that case, you just need IRB approval. But if you are subject to the IDE requirements and you're not exempt, then you need to make a risk determination. And if your study is non-significant risk, that means that you need an abbreviated IDE, and that that's gonna just be overseen by the IRB. <coughs> However, if it is a significant risk device study or SR study, then you're gonna need a full IDE, and you're gonna need both FDA and IRB approval. Does that make sense to everybody before I move on to some case scenarios? Great. All right, so let's practice. All right, so scenario one, contact lens solutions intended for use in lubricating or re-wetting would be considered A, a device, B, a drug, or C, a biologic. So who thinks this solution would be a device? Raise your hand. Maybe one, okay. Who thinks this would be a drug? few hands. Biologic? few hands. Okay. So this is a tricky one, so I don't blame you. Um, this is actually a device. So lubricating or re-wetting is not considered chemical action. Um, so in this case, this is a device. If you were going to add something like a uh, sanitizer or some other kind of therapeutic drug into the contact lens solution, then it would probably be a combination product, um, and the primary mode of action would need to be determined. Um, but as it is, this is actually a device. It's a tough one. All right, scenario two. The objective of a study is to assess which of two FDA-approved imaging devices provides better images for the diagnosis and evaluation of stroke. So there's two devices in this study, the 3D volumetric scanner and the Siemens Antares scanner. And both of these devices are going to be used according to their approved label in the study. So is this a device study? What do you guys think? Are they testing safety or effectiveness of any devices in the study? Who thinks yes? Okay, yes, you're correct. Um, the objective of the study is to assess the safety or effectiveness of device, so it is a device study. So do you think the study can be ID exempt, or would it require an abbreviated or full IDE? Do you have any guesses? Okay, so it appears that these devices are going to be used according to their approved labeling. So in this case, that does meet that first ID exemption criteria we talked about. Um, so this study could be exempt. All right, scenario three. An investigator is evaluating the utility of a software program for motion correction and MRI imaging. The MRI pulse sequences used to perform these scans are FDA approved. And these images are going to be collected as part of routine clinical care. And then they're going to analyze these images using the software and compare it to those processed conventionally. So are there any medical devices in this study? This is a pretty easy one, yes. Um, so there's both the software system and the actual MRI. Um, and so in this case, the software system is intended for use in the diagnosis of disease or other conditions. Um, it's being considered a diagnostic medical device in this case. So is this a device study? Are they testing safety or effectiveness of the software or the MRI? Who thinks yes? No thoughts, OK. Um, so yes, uh, the objective of the study is to assess that software and how well it corrects motion artifacts. So this study is subject to 21 CFR 812. 
okay, so can this study be IDE exempt or does it require an abbreviated or full IDE? So just as a reminder, I posted the diagnostic device exemption criteria here. So the diagnostic device has to be a non-invasive, can't require invasive sampling that presents significant risk, cannot introduce energy, can't be used as a diagnostic procedure without confirmation of that diagnosis. So who thinks this can be exempt? Okay, we have a few people saying yes, and that is correct. So in this case, the study can be IDE exempt since those MRI scans I mentioned were being performed for clinical care. So what if additional scans were being performed for research purposes? Do you think that would change anything? It would. Um, so in this case, it wouldn't be exempt because these scans are going to introduce energy. So in this case, even though the software itself that we're evaluating isn't introducing energy, the testing of that software does introduce energy because you need to use that MRI, which is introducing energy. And so if the scans were being performed just for research purposes, um, it would not be exempt. And then the IRB would need to make a significant risk or non-significant risk determination. Do we have any questions about that? would be used to develop an algorithm. You're saying that that then is an IDE? Yes, if they're doing additional scans just for research purposes, since they are introducing energy using this testing, um, that would require either an abbreviated or a full IDE. So if they were doing um, a review of imaging retrospectively on, you know, uh, uh, let's say we did uh, lung cancer patients and we did 4D CT scans, and then somebody's, the physicist decided retrospectively to go back and review all of those images to perhaps, you know, develop a new software or mm -hmm. algorithm. Is, would you consider that needing an IDE? So were those scans initially performed just for clinical care right. and then you're just going back to look at them? Right. In that case, that was just clinical care. So Even the if they're developing count. an algorithm. Even if you're developing, well, other, you would have to consider other aspects of the study. Um, so in this case, the energy wouldn't count, but you would have to consider the rest of the study. So it depends how you're using the algorithm. If you're just developing it and you're not using it, um, you know, to make any kind of treatment decisions in your study. But you could in the future. In the future, yes. So it's kind of a gray area, um, as we'll kind of talk about in the next one. Um, and Sarah's actually going to talk about algorithms a little bit more later in the talk. Um, so maybe we'll clarify that. But yeah, so I think in the scenario that you described, we would still consider those device studies because they have the objective of testing safety and effectiveness of that algorithm they're developing. So then the first question really becomes, if it's subject to the IDE regulations, can the study be exempt? And you painted two scenarios, one of which you're introducing energy kind of for research purposes only. We would say in that scenario, uh, we would count that energy and therefore say that cannot be exempt and the IRB and sponsor would go on to make a significant risk, non-significant risk determination to determine how, how the study would be overseen, either by the IRB or the FDA. And the second scenario you painted, where they're not actually introducing extra energy for research purposes, but just retrospectively going back and looking at those clinical scans, we would then apply, again, the same diagnostic exemption criteria. We think that's still subject to 812, um, but we would not count the energy in that case. And so it appears, based on the very brief description, um, as long as the, the algorithm isn't being used to drive any kind of therapeutic decision at that point, we would agree that it would meet those exemption criteria and could be IDE exempt. If you have any questions, absolutely. We're happy to make these uh, assessments or help kind of uh, highlight things that you should be considering or thinking about when putting together these studies and determining if the IDE regulations apply. Absolutely. All right, thank you, Erica. Um, so we have one more scenario. So in scenario four, an investigator is assessing whether there is a correlation between circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA levels before chemotherapy treatment with disease-free and overall survival in breast cancer patients. So if a correlation does exist, this information could be used in the future to determine who would most benefit from chemotherapy treatment. And so the investigator is going to collect blood samples before chemotherapy. They're going to quantitate circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA levels using an assay developed in the lab. 
and then they're going to continue to follow the patients to collect that survival data. Okay, so is there a medical device in this study? What do you guys think? See some yeses and some noes. So yes, um, in this case, the assay used to measure the circulating tumor DNA is part of an in vitro diagnostic device. Um, so remember, you have to really consider everything with that in vitro diagnostic, how it's collected, um, how the results are processed, et cetera. So do you think this is a device study? Are they testing safety or effectiveness of any device in this study? Okay, so yes, in this case, the objective of the study is to assess the effectiveness of using certain biomarkers, in this case, circulating tuber DNA levels, to predict treatment outcomes. So this is what we would consider the early development of an in vitro diagnostic device. Um, does that make sense to everyone? You're kind of validating the utility of using this information, so it's considered uh, the early development of an in vitro diagnostic device. Okay, so can this study be IDE exempt or does it require an abbreviated or a full IDE? Any thoughts? Oh, here's the exemption criteria in case that's helpful. Okay, so yes, um, this study appears that it can be IDE exempt. So I mentioned that blood draws are considered non-invasive, um, so you don't need to worry about that in this case. And then also it doesn't appear that they're really using this information to make treatment decisions. Um, so they also meet that fourth criteria, um, so this study could be exempt. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Well, if there's no more questions, um, we can take a break. Oh, but we have a question. So kind of related to that last scenario, say you have a study with a drug, and also you're collecting tissue for um, in vitro diagnostic development. Um, but the study already has an IND, and we have this situation sometimes. So then you say you're, you're um, and often we'll say standard of care biopsy with excess tissue for research so that it's non-significant risk. But a lot of times we'll have the option of you can do a research-only biopsy or you can do the standard of care with excess to research. So in that situation, I guess question one, if you already have an IND, how does that play in? And then two, um, how does that work with having the option of research versus standard of care? Sure. So if you already have an IND, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't need an IDE. Okay. Um, so 812 would still apply. And you we might would, have to submit separately then? You would, it requires a full IDE. In that situation you described, um, it depends on the risk of the study. So if the IRB said it was NSR, it could just be an abbreviated ID, or maybe it would meet the exemption criteria. Um, so you mentioned that it could either be leftover tissue, so in that case, maybe it would meet the exemption criteria if it's just kind of early development. Um, but if it's you're taking additional research samples, then you really have to assess whether that's presenting significant risk, and maybe it wouldn't be exempt. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So I guess, yeah, you may, it, it is possible to submit an IND and an IDE for the same study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that wasn't always clearly the case, but um, the centers at FDA aren't necessarily talking to each other and telling them what studies they're overseeing, um, so it is necessary. Do we have any other questions? All right, um, we can take a break, maybe meet back here at 10.15. All right, let's get started with part two. So I'm Sarah Gamberling, and I'll be talking about IDE best practices and additional studies. And so I do want to say, if anyone's having any connectivity issues with Wi-Fi in the room, please talk to um, Stephanie. She was going to be over here. I don't know where she went. There she is. Um, so if you're having any issues, come over here and talk to them. They can help you out. They're adjusting the volume, so hopefully you can hear me better. All right, so just a few quick reminders and housekeeping things. Um, this session will be recorded and available on our website. Um, and anyone who's joining us via WebEx, please keep yourselves muted. Um, if you have any questions, type them into the chat box to Erica, and she will read them aloud for everyone. 
For everyone here, um, there's exits towards the back. The restrooms are over this way on the left. Um, we have some microphones. If you want to ask questions, I'm happy to take questions at any time. There should be some time at the end as well. Um, and please remember to fill out the evaluation. Um, it could be helpful for us so we can improve this workshop for next year. So in part two, we'll be talking about the IDE. So if you've determined that you have a significant risk study, we'll go through everything you need to do to compile your IDE and submit it. And then we'll talk about how you maintain your IDE in good standing with the FDA. Then we'll also talk about ex the expanded access program or sometimes called compassionate use. So this is a way to use unapproved medical devices to treat patients, so outside of a clinical investigation. And finally, we'll talk about algorithms and mobile medical applications. So you may not always think of these as medical devices, but they can sometimes fit into that definition. So we'll talk about how FDA sees these and how they regulate them. So jumping right into the IDE. All these sections are what you need to include in your IDE. So we'll go through each one of them. The ones in red will go into a little bit more detail. And I do want to say that on our website, we have a template that you can use for the IDE, as well as a template for the cover letter. So we have those available for anyone who would like to download them. So first off, the cover sheet, Form FDA 3514. I know a lot of you are here for the IND workshop, so I'll try to bring some parallels from the IND. So this is similar to the Form 1571. Um, it's used for any device submissions to CDRH, so not only for the IDE, but also marketing applications, meeting requests, requests for designation. Because it can be used for so many purposes, it's a little bit bulky. I think it's like five pages. So there's going to be sections that don't apply for your IDE. But what it's useful for is it captures a lot of really important information. So you can list what, what kind of submission this is. Is it your original IDE submission or an amendment or supplement? You can also include information on the device, so its name, intended use, the product code and classification. There's places to list the sponsor and manufacturer, so those can be separate people. They may also be the same if you're developing your own device. And you can also list if there's any previous discussions with the FDA that are relevant to this submission. So as it says in the top of the slide, this is actually a voluntary form for IDE, so you don't have to submit it. Um, but it is a useful way to capture this information. If you choose not to use this form, be sure to include all that information in your cover letter so the FDA knows exactly um, what this submission includes. All right, the next section is name and address of the sponsor. So this is an easy one. Name the sponsor and give the address. So, <laughs> yeah, easy, right? Um, mailing address, email address, phone number. Make it easy for FDA to contact you. So the first big section is report of prior investigations. So in this section, you will include any prior investigations that support the use of your device, particularly in your proposed clinical investigation. So these can be investigations that you did or somebody else did and they can include anything from bench research, animal research, or even other clinical investigations. So within this section, you want to summarize all those different investigations. If it's something that's already been published, you can simply summarize that and reference it accordingly. If any of those are really critical to understanding how your device works or understanding how it's going to be used within your study, you can include a reprint. Um, FDA doesn't have access to all publications, so it can be helpful for them, um, but probably limit that to just a couple reprints. Don't include 20. Um, so for any information that's unpublished, include a summary of that and data. Give them the results um, and let them know how it's relevant to your proposed investigation. And finally, if any of those non-clinical studies were done according to GLP or good laboratory practice, make sure to note that because that lets FDA know um, that the results are a little bit more reliable. Um, so GLP is a little bit more intense than just being really careful in the lab. It requires having dedicated protocols, SOPs, um, quality assurance oversight. Um, so if you do, do go through all that effort to do a GLP, make sure it's noted for the FDA. Right. 
Next big section is the investigational plan. So this may be one of your largest sections of the IDE. So within this section, you want to state what the purpose of this IDE is. So you're going to name your device and say what your intended use is, um, what your objectives and the proposed duration of your investigational plan will be. You also include a copy of your protocol here. So within your protocol, you should have the methodology of how you're going to be using your device, how you're going to be analyzing it, um, whatever statistical methods you're going to use to determine the outcomes of your clinical study. You should also include a risk analysis. So how detailed this is really depends on your device. So if you're using a device that maybe it's already been on the market or it's already been used before, you're just doing it in a slightly different indication, you can just talk about what the new uses of your device are and what the risks associated with that are. Because FDA wants to consider this in terms of the risk assessment that they have and if this is going to be safe enough to use in subjects. However, if you're using a completely new device, if this is going to be a first-in-man study, you're going to have to have a very thorough risk analysis. So you'll want to describe all the inputs and outputs of your device, and if they were to fail, what would the risk to the subject be? And along with that, you should also describe any design implications that you've put into either the device or the protocol that could help mitigate some of those risks. Um, so just let FTA know uh, any risks associated with the device. Then you'll include the device description. I know Kelly talked about this a little earlier in, the, in terms of the pre-sub. So this is, again, something that can cause a hang-up during the review process. So you really want to put some time and thought into your device description and make sure it's easy for someone who's not already familiar with your device to understand what it does. So again, describe all the, the functions of your device. Um, describe all the different parts. It's really helpful to have diagrams, engineering drawings with each part labeled. Make sure that the FDA will know exactly what your device is doing. And it can be helpful to have somebody else who's not familiar with it to read that to make sure they can understand what your device is doing. So next, monitoring procedures. All IDEs should be, um, all the studies should be monitored. So if you are a sponsor investigator, just a single site study, you can act as the monitor for the study, that you should review the study and make sure it's being done according to protocol. If you have a multi-site study, you should have a plan for how you're going to monitor all those sites, and you should name the monitor that you're going to be using. And lastly, you can include any additional records or reports that could be useful for justifying um, the use of the device in your clinical investigation. All right, the next big section is manufacturing information. Now again, what goes into this really depends on your device. So if you're using an FDA-approved de device, but um, it's off-label or you're being, it's being modified in some way, you can refer to the approved product labeling. Um, that's because the FDA already has an idea of how this is manufactured. But you would want to describe any of those changes that you made if there is a modification. So that could be a fairly simple, straightforward uh, manufacturing section. If you're using a non-FDA approved device, but you're getting it from a company, you will need to get all the manufacturing information from that company. Um, so hopefully they'll share that with you. But as you can imagine, if this is something that they're trying to commercialize, they may not want to share that with you that might have proprietary information. So one way to get around this is that you can use a letter of authorization. I know this was mentioned yesterday during our IND workshop. So if they have already submitted their manufacturing information to the FDA in some other application, they can let you reference that through a letter of authorization. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Now the most intense section, will, or intense scenario will be if you have um, a non-FDA approved device that you are manufacturing. So in that case, you will have to provide a full description of how that device is manufactured, the methods where it's being manufactured, any controls you have in place, um, how your device is going to be packaged, stored, and if applicable, how it's installed. So what is an LOA, a letter of authorization? Like I mentioned, this is a letter from the company, so whatever company may be manufacturing your device, and it's a letter to their existing application. So that could be another IDE. Um, it could be an IND if it's being studied as a drug, an investigation new drug, or a master file uh, or a master access file. 
<clears throat> so a master file is something that's not associated with a clinical investigation, but it is one way for the company to have um, uh, on file any of their processes so that it can be referenced using a letter of authorization. So this letter um, gives the FDA permission to reference whatever they already have on file in support of your IDE. Um, importantly, it doesn't give you permission to see it, only the FDA to look at it. So they'll submit this to their existing application and they should give you a copy and you'll just include it with your IDE as well. Okay, the next section is the investigator agreement. So a quick review, who is the investigator? It's the individual who actually conducts the clinical investigation under whose immediate di direction the investigation device is administered, dispensed to, or used involving human subjects. So I know it's often the case here at Duke, there may be a team of investigators that all work together that treat the same patient population. Um, but the investigator in this sense is whoever is going to be the responsible team leader in terms of this clinical investigation. So what you'll want to include for your investigator agreement, this will be something that you have each investigator sign. You don't have to uh, submit a signed investigator agreement, but the FDA wants an example of what you will have each investigator sign before they are added onto the study. So part of this, you'll want to collect a CV from the investigator, so this is something that you'll have on file. Within the investigator agreement, you should also have a statement of the investigator's relevant experience. So why are they qualified to be an investigator on your study? You also need to include, um, if the investigator was involved in an investigation that was terminated, you need to explain the circumstances. So by terminated, I mean terminated by the FDA. It doesn't include if the study was completed or it was withdrawn for whatever reason, maybe lack of funding or you said it wasn't a good idea. Um, if the FDA terminates a study, it's usually for something bad. Um, either lots of risks or somebody did something inappropriate. Um, even if that's the case and investigator was involved, they may not have had anything to do with the reason it was terminated. So just explain any circumstances so the FDA knows. You should also include financial disclosure information. So if this is going to be a study supporting um, commercialization of the device, you should collect from the investigator if they have um, any proprietary information or proprietary um, interest in your device, if they're getting any payments to be um, investigating the study or getting payments from the company. And they should also promise to update you if that changes at any time throughout the investigation. And finally, there should be a statement um, of the investigator's agreement to conduct the investigation according to this agreement, supervise all testing, and ensure that the requirements of obtaining informed consent are met. So if you're familiar with um, INDs or you're paying attention yesterday, this is somewhat similar to the Form 1572 for drugs. Um, however, FDA does not have a standard form, but we did use kind of, we loosely based a, um, an investigator agreement template off of the 1572 and that is available on our website for download if this is something that um, could be helpful for you. All right, so those are the, the very detailed sections. We'll go through the rest of them here. Um, the investigator certification, it's related to that investig investigator agreement. So within the certification, you just have to say that as a sponsor, you certify that you will make each investigator sign the investigator agreement as they're added to the study. Pretty straightforward. IRB information, you need to include information on any IRBs that will be um, reviewing the study at any site, so their name and contact information. And then again, name and address of any institutions that will be participating in your study. <clears throat> for financial claims, so for device studies, you are allowed to charge for the use of the device as long as that doesn't constitute commercialization. So you can't be profiting from the investigation. So if you are gonna be charging for your device, this is a section where you would say, how much you're going to be charging, and explain why that does not constitute commercialization. So section 10, environmental assessment, this one's really easy. It's no longer required. Um, we do have it in our template, and we suggest keeping it in there because 
it's still part of the regulations, but FDA clearly says on their website that they don't require an envi um, environmental assessment. So 11, labeling. So you should include copies of any labeling that's gonna be on your device. Um, as long as your device is able to be labeled, I know some devices such as like an in vitro diagnostic, it might not be easy to label the device, but as long as your device can be labeled either on the actual device or whatever accompanying packaging, you should include that co a copy of that. And what you should have on your labeling is the name of the device, the name and address of the manufacturer. You should also have a statement that says caution investigational device limited by federal law to investigational use. Um, <clears throat> depending on the device, you might also want to have any warnings or precautions or instructions for use, anything that's important to be able to use that device safely. In section 12, informed consent. So you do need to include a copy of informed consent form. It's required for devices. Um, and FDA will review that and give you comments on it if they have any um, concerns. And then section 13, additional information. You don't have to include anything here. This is where we would suggest putting any reprints of publications if you do want to include them, um, or if there's just anything else that you think is important for including with your IDE. So hopefully that's fairly straightforward. Any questions on the content? Okay. Like I said, we do have a template available if you're interested. So once you compile all of that, um, now you can submit your IDE. So you'll need to include uh, three copies of your application. So one of those copies should be a paper copy, and then you'll have two electronic copies or e-copies. Um, an e-copy should be accompanied by a paper cover letter. So we'll discuss what the requirements for an e-copy are in the next few slides. And once you get all your copies made, then you'll mail them to the FDA. Um, most products are gonna be regulated by CDRH and so the address is here. Um, a few devices, um, particularly ones that um, are used for the manufacturing or processing of blood, blood products, cell therapies, or in vitro diagnostics for um, checking blood, those are, reg those are regulated by CBER. Um, so you'll send it to the appropriate document control center. Okay, so what, what do I mean by an e-copy? So the FDA wants electronic copies of your application, um, and this will be PDFs that are sent to them on some sort of electronic media. So that can be a CD, DVD, or flash drive. And so the e-copy should be identical to your paper copy. If for some reason there's a difference, for instance, if you really want to include maybe a video of how your device is used, uh, you need to include in your paper copy a placeholder saying, you know, we have a video of our device um, and this is where you can find it on the e-copy. So with both your paper copy and your e-copy, you need to have a cover letter that has an, um, a valid e-copy statement. Basically just say the e-copy is an exact um, duplicate of the paper copy. And so the, the primary format will be on PDFs. And so both the PDFs and whatever electronic media needs to be free of any security settings. It needs to be something that they can easily open. You also want to make sure you don't include any extra uh, files uh, with your e-copy. And the FTA really appreciates if you use bookmarks and hyperlinks within your PDF. It's not required, but anything that can make it easily navigatable, um, they would greatly appreciate. So they also say that you should use Adobe Acrobat 11 or below to make your PDFs. And this is just to ensure that um, the documents can be opened on any computers that they may have there. Um, just because as an aside, I've used Adobe DC and haven't had an issue, but that was at my own risk. Um, and all of the documents should be 50 megabases or smaller in size. So if you have any questions about these requirements, there is a guidance document, I think I have a Link on the next slide that you can look at those. What's also very important for your e-copy is naming it correctly. So most submissions um, to CDRH will use a non-volume based naming system. So this means you can have one or more uh, PDF files just that open up um, without being within a separate folder. So the way to name this, you need to have a prefix that starts with 001 underscore, and then a descriptive name. You can have more than one uh, 
document, the next one would be 002 underscore descriptive name. So for the first example here, we use the IDE number and then progress report. Um, and the numbering is important because that's how it gets loaded into the FDA system. Whatever is labeled as one will be the first document that they open. So just make it very clear and easy to navigate for them. For very large submissions, which could include your original IDE if you have, for instance, a lot of um, prior investigations that you want to summarize, you can use a volume-based. Basically, this just means that you will have folders that within them have all the PDFs. So one way to organize it would be to have one volume for administrative information that would have your cover letter, the name of your sponsor, um, perhaps the 3514. And then once you open that folder, you would see additional PDFs. And these are named very similarly with 001 underscore descriptive title. So again, at the bottom of the page here is the, a link to a guidance document uh, from the FDN e-copies. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. The FDA also tries to make it as easy as possible on you to make an appropriate e-copy. So they have two um, tools that are available for download on their website. So the first is the e-submitter e-copies tool. Um, and so this is something that can help you format your e-copy, make sure it's named correctly, and it'll save a copy of it onto your computer. So we'll say that we don't typically use this in our office. We like to just make our own PDFs following the guidance, but it's definitely available um, if you like to use it. The second uh, tool is an e-copies validation module. And this is something that we do use for all of our e-copies. Um, basically, it's just a tool that, val that verifies that you've formatted your e-copy correctly. Um, so you just drag your file in there and it'll tell you if it passes all the requirements or not. And if it doesn't, it should tell you what the issue is. So this is important because if you don't have an e-copy that meets all their specifications, then you'll be put on e-copy hold, which just means that the review process won't start until you provide a valid e-copy. So what does the FDA review process look like once you submit your original IDE? So first off, as a sponsor, you're gonna be notified um, once the FDA receives it, and you'll get an email that says the date that they received it. Uh, they'll give you your IDE number, which is important to remember, because any subsequent uh, correspondence should reference that IDE number. Um, they'll also state what you listed as the um, sponsor and the device name. Yeah, so they'll give you your ID number. It'll always start with the G. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, if an e-copy is missing or it doesn't meet the requirements, you'll be placed on e-copy hold. And to get off of hold, you send a, a new e-copy, a full e-copy, even if just one part of it that doesn't meet their specifications with a, another cover letter that states that this is a replacement e-copy. So once it's in FDA's hands, they have 30 calendar days to review your IDE. So if you don't hear anything from the FDA in that 30 days, it's considered to be approved, but we always think it's best practice to contact them just to make sure you weren't missing any communications. So there are a few different outcomes of this review process. First, best case scenario, IDE approval. That's great, that means you can start your clinical study. You can also get IDE approval with conditions. So this would just mean if FDA um, has a few things that they would like you to change about your submission, maybe um, changes to part of your protocol or your informed consent form that they don't think necessarily mean you need to delay consenting subjects, but they would like you to change those. Um, though clearly if they have a concern with the consent form, you should change that first before um, consenting anyone. You can also have staged approval. So by stage approval, this is where the FDA will allow you to start your investigation with a smaller subset of patients than what um, you originally um, suggested. So they may do this if they think there is a you know, significant risk. They want to minimize that by only looking at a small subset of patients. Um, you'll use the device, get some results, and then go back to them, and then they can um, consider if it, they should open it up to a larger number of patients. And that can be, of course, with or without conditions. 
And then the final outcome is IDE disapproval, which means you can't go on with your study. If you do get a disapproval, the FDA will tell you why. They'll also give you an opportunity to meet with them, um, have a teleconference, and discuss any concerns they had and ways that you could fix that, adjust it so that you could get, um, hopefully, an approval. Um, and during the review process, they do try to make this interactive. So if they have you know, some quick questions, you'll hear from them. And hopefully, you can communicate during the review process and avoid uh, a disapproval. All right. So before we move on, are there any questions on the IDE? So once you have an active IDE, that's great. Um, you are allowed to start consenting subjects as long as you have IRB approvals in place as well. So don't forget that part. Um, you should also register the trial at clinicaltrials.gov if it's applicable. So clinicaltrials.gov is a database of clinical trials. Um, it's been required since 2007. It was introduced with FDA. So I know most of you were here for the IND workshop and you may be familiar with the Form 3674 that was required for INDs in terms of um, seeing that you registered um, at, with clinicaltrials.gov. That's not required for IDEs or device studies. Um, there's actually no requirement for an official um, correspondence in terms of clinicaltrials.gov with your IDE. Um, so you do need to register by law if you are an applicable clinical trial. Um, and that will apply to clinical trials that are other than like a small feasibility study. So there's also other reasons why you may want to register, uh, even if you don't fit into the applicable clinical trial definition. So most publications will require that the study is registered there um, before you enroll any patients in order to actually publish the results of the study. So I know for most academic investigators, that's um, something that they really want to do. So that's one great reason to register. Also, the NIH now wants um, any studies that get NIH funding to be registered. Um, so if you have any questions about if you need to register, if you should register, or how to register, um, then Docker, there's a really great group that can help you out. And here's their email address. So once your IDE is approved, at some point, you're probably going to want to make some modifications. And that's allowed. So any modifications to the investigational plan, and that can include both your device and your clinical protocol, those need to be submitted to the FDA. And depending on what the, the change is, uh, there's different re um, reporting timelines. So some changes will require prior approval and a 30-day um, review by the FDA, so you'll need to wait until the FDA gives you an approval on that change. Some won't require their prior approval, but you'll need to let the FDA know within five days of making the change. And some can be submitted as part of the annual report. So we'll go through some uh, examples of what falls into each of these categories. Oh. And there is a link to a guidance document that has a little bit more information as well if you want to reference that. So first off, modifications that require prior approval of a 30-day review by FDA. This would be any changes that could impact the validity of data, scientific soundness, or the right safety and welfare of study subjects. So here are just a few examples of what would fit into this. If you want to change the indication that you're studying, um, that would require um, prior approval by the FDA. If you're changing the type or nature of a study control or your primary endpoint, or if you're making any significant design changes to your device, uh, the FDA would want to know that uh, ahead of time. Or if you're changing the statistical methods that you're going to use to evaluate the outcomes of your study, or if you want to expand the study by adding new sites or a larger number of patients, those all need to go to the FDA as a prior approval submission. So things that can be submitted with just a five-day notice. Um, that is anything that does not affect the validity of data, scientific soundness, or right safety and welfare of study subjects. So a few examples of this could be a modification to your inclusion exclusion criteria. So if you're just um, better defining what your um, population of subjects will be, 
that just needs a five-day notice, if you're increasing the frequency at which information is gathered, or if you're making uh, changes to your device that um, are more minor, um, and that they're not significant, that can be a five-day notice, or modifying secondary endpoints. Also included in five-day notice is any change that you make for emergency purposes. If there's something you need to change about your device or the study in order to avoid harming a patient, definitely do that um, and let the FDA know within five days. Throw out changes that you can submit as part of the annual report. These are anything minor. Um, again, that don't affect the validity of data, scientific soundness, or right safety and welfare study subjects. So this could be um, changes to your monitoring procedures if you decide to change who your monitor is going to be. If you're making any labeling changes, um, having better instructions for use or um, making it uh, more user friendly, uh, informed consent materials, any, any minor changes with those, you can wait for the annual report. Updating IRB information, the purpose of the study, so that can include like the name of your device so if you decide to name it something that will be used um, for further commercialization. And if you have any updates to your risk analysis, as you've gathered more data during your investigation, um, you can update that during your annual report. So in addition to changes to your ID, there's also other submissions you'll need to make just to maintain your IDE. So if there's any unanticipated adverse device effects, you need to let the FDA know about that within 10 working days, and we'll talk about that a little bit more on the next slide. If any IRBs um, that are reviewing your study withdraw their approval, you need to let the FDA know within five working days. You'll need to let the FDA know who are the investigators on your study, and that needs to be sent to them every six months. Additionally, you'll need to do an annual progress report, at least yearly. Part of that is you can include that list of investigators. Um, we talked about uh, changes to investigational plans, so any you know, plan deviations, those will either be the five working days or the 30-day pre-approval. If you fail to obtain informed consent, let the FDA know in five days. Um, any recall or device disposition, let the FDA know what happens with the device um, within 30 working days. Um, significant risk determination, so if any IRBs uh, make a significant risk determination outside of an ID, you need to let the FDA know within five working days. And finally, there is a requirement for a final report for IDEs. This isn't the case for INDs. But within 30 days of completing your study, you need to notify the FDA. And then six months, um, you need to send your final report. So a little bit more on unanticipated adverse device effect. So FDA defines this as any serious adverse effect on health or safety or any life-threatening problem or death caused by associated with a device if that effect, problem, or death was not previously identified in nature, severity, or degree of incidence in the investigational plan or application. So it needs to be um, serious, life-threatening, and unanticipated. And like I mentioned before, this needs to be submitted to the FDA within 10 working days. You should do an evaluation um, and let them know what happened and what the outcomes were. So I also mentioned that you need to do your, an annual progress report and a final report. So we'll go through what is required in that. And I will note that we have um, a template available on our website for progress reports as well. So the first section is basic information. IDE number, name of the device, sponsor, and their contact information. And then you'll update them on your study progress. So they'll want you know, a brief summary of what's happening with your investigation, um, the number of investigators and sites, number of subjects that have been enrolled, how many devices you've shipped, and what's happened with those. Give a brief summary of results, if you have any. Um, a summary of all anticipated and unanticipated adverse effects and any deviations from the investigational plan uh, since your last report. Next, you'll update your risk analysis. I mentioned this earlier. If you gain new information during the investigation, um, update what you already sent to them in your original IDE. Uh, if there were any publications that came out um, of this device, of the study, you should include reprints of those in the risk analysis. 
Um, and then any other changes that haven't been submitted to them already, you should also include. So any changes in your manufacturing proct um, practices um, or any other of those minor updates to investigational plan, um, let the FDA know at this time. So the final section, marketing application of future plans. So the FDA is interested to know where you are on the, your steps to commercializing the product. So if you're an academic investigator and you're not planning to commercialize a device, that's fine. Just state that here. Otherwise, they're interested to know um, if you're going to be submitting a marketing application and how far off you think that's going to be. All right. So to make things a little bit more confusing, everything that we mentioned before um, would fit into um, three different types of submissions. So it could be a supplement, a report, or amendment. And I have a link to a guidance document here that discusses each of these. So we'll go through examples of what would fit into each of these three categories. It's important to know what kind of submission you're sending because supplements, reports, and amendments are numbered separately by the FTA. So you have supplement one, two, and three, report one, two, and three, et cetera. So supplements are things that um, you will expect FDA to review and reply to. So you'll usually get some sort of reply, either like an approval or disapproval, similar to what you got with your original ID. So some examples of what would fit into a supplement are the, any of those approvals for changes, so either the, the prior 30-day approval or five-day notices. Um, <clears throat> if you want to add a new study to your IDE, that is a supplement. And unlike drugs, there is a 30-day you know, review process. If you want to expand your study in terms of sites or number of subjects, that's a supplement. Um, if you want to terminate the enrollment of study, letting them know that, uh, or notifying that the study has been suspended, that would be a supplement. If you want to request approval for compassionate use, um, which we'll talk about in a few more slides, or if you want an extension of time to respond to um, an FDA request, that would also be a supplement. So reports are things that you wouldn't necessarily expect a reply from FDA. You don't need their approval. You're just letting them know of a change. It's more of an update. So for the reports, FDA wouldn't respond to you unless they have some sort of concern. So things that fit into the reports are your list of investigators and your annual progress report. Um, if you fail to obtain informed consent, um, the, any adverse device effects, the report of completion of your enrollment or the study, and your final IDE report. Those are all reports because you're just updating the FTA on things that have happened. So the final category is an amendment. So an amendment can be submitted to either your original IDE, a supplement, or a report. So an amendment is sent in response to an FDA's request for um, additional information. So it could be in response to a disapproval or an approval with conditions, letting them know that you've met the conditions or refuse to accept um, or any other deficiency. You can also submit an amendment to a voluntary withdrawal in order to reverse that. And so amendments, um, like supplements reports, are numbered individually. So you'll have amendment one potentially to supplement two, amendment two to supplement two, amendment one to supplement four, um, so it's important to keep in mind what category your submission falls into, and FDA is going to be keeping track of this. So if you have, con you know, concerns about how it should be categorized, you should um, contact your contact for the IDE. All right. So how do you terminate or close your IDE? Uh, I know you don't want to be sending annual reports forever. So if your IDE isn't approved yet, if you're still within that 30-day review period and you've decided for whatever reason you don't want to go forward with the study, you just request a withdrawal. If it's already become active but no subjects have been enrolled, you again request a withdrawal, but you'll also need to state why and account for the device. Because if you remember, having an approved IDE gives you permission to ship the device. So you'll need to let the FTA know um, where, our, where any devices are and count for all of those. If subjects have already been enrolled, um, you will need to, you know, depending on the device and the study, you may need to do some follow-up just to ensure that um, the patients are safely followed. 
you may need to collect devices from them. Um, so give them a plan of how you will do any f necessary follow-up for subject safety. Finally, if you complete the study, notify FDA within 30 days and send your final report within six months. All right, so are there any questions on IDA maintenance? expect for an IMD that you do it every six months? I'm so loud. I don't know. Did you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so the question was, why is there a difference for drugs and devices in terms of updating the list of investigators? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know the. I don't know what their rationale is. Uh, there is a, that difference for INDs. You don't need to update a list of investigators. I don't think you have to send them, you know, a specific list. You'll update them with 1572s and. Right. It'll be part of the IND, but you don't need to have a separate list. Do you guys know the rationale? FDA works in mysterious ways sometimes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Anybody else? Okay. So the next um, subject is expand access program or compassionate use. Like I mentioned before, this is a way to use an unapproved device um, outside of a clinical investigation, so primarily for just to treat patients. So there are a few different categories of expanded access. So the first we'll talk about is emergency use of an unapproved device. So um, ways that you can be eligible for emergency use, expanded access, is if a patient has a life-threatening or serious disease or condition that needs immediate treatment, so it's an emergency. There's also a requirement that there's no generally acceptable alternative treatment for the, uh, for the condition. And because of the immediate nature, um, there's no time to get FDA approval um, through another means, such as uh, through an IDE. So FDA will allow you to have emergency use of an unapproved device without their prior approval, as long as the physician meets these five criteria. So the first is informed consent. So even though it's an emergency, there's still that requirement to get informed consent. You also need to get you know, clearance or approval from the institution, um, whatever their policies may be, and concurrence from an IRB chairperson. Um, so most IRBs should have an emergency contact. Um, you still need to let them know and get their approval. You need to have an independent assessment from an uninvolved physician. So someone who's qualified enough to um, concur that this is a serious life-threatening condition and there's no alternative you know, treatments and it's an emergency. And finally, you need authorization from the device manufacturer. So if you're in this situation, it's probably because you know of this unapproved device. It may be something that is being used in a clinical study at your institution. You know where it is. Maybe it's something that you're developing. Um, you still need authorization from that manufacturer that it's okay to use within this for this situation. And then you need to notify FTA of that emergency use within five days. So uh, other categories of expanded access that are not emergency use versus compassionate use. So this can either be for an individual patient or a small group. And again, um, it's only for serious or life-threatening conditions with no generally acceptable alternative treatments. Um, because it's not an emergency, you do need prior approval from both the FDA and IRB. And so the typical time frame for this is during a clinical investigation um, or early development of the device. So another option is treatment use of an ID, and this is typically for larger groups of patients. Again, for serious life threatening conditions with no alternative treatment. There is a requirement that this has some evidence of efficacy. Um, so typically this is done in later stage trials either during clinical investigation or after the clinical trial has been completed, um, because you do need some evidence that this is efficacious. And there's also a requirement that the sponsor is actively pursuing a marketing application um, with due diligence. So it's something that they're either doing these studies in order to submit a marketing application, either a 510K or PMA, or they're working on the application or in the review period. Um, so because of this, it's typically done later stage clinical trials or after the trial's been completed. Questions on that? 
So we have kind of a, a bonus topic here, humanitarian device exemptions. Um, it's similar that you also need IRB approval for these. So humanitarian device exemption is actually a marketing application for use for a humanitarian use device. What these are, these are devices that treat rare or orphan diseases. An FDA categorizes this as something that, a condition that affects fewer than 8,000 individuals in the U.S. per year. And so an HGE is similar to a PMA in that it will require a, you know, a full submission to the FDA um, showing safety, but the exemption part comes from, it's exempt from showing effectiveness. And this is because since it's such a small patient population, it's hard to get the number of subjects needed in order to you know, prove the effectiveness. Um, but since it's treating um, uh, you know, a disease or condition that's such a small population, they don't want that to be a barrier to getting that to patients. So if you have a, um, a device that's approved through the humanitarian device exemption, um, that can be uh, commercialized, but it has to be used under the um, under review of an IRB. So the IRB needs to approve the use of that H HUD device. So I know this is a little outside of the, the IDEs, but this is something that comes through the IRB occasionally. I know sometimes um, this is used at, at places like Duke. Any other questions? Okay, so last category is algorithms and mobile medical applications. So these are things that can fit the definition of a medical device. So uh, an algorithm as a medical device, this would be something that combines multiple variables using an interpretation function to yield a single patient-specific result um, that's intended for use in the diagnosis of a disease or other conditions or in the cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease. So see how that incorporates the definition of medical device. And it should also be non-transparent and something that can't be easily independently verified by the end user. So this wouldn't include you know, simple clinical calculations like creatinine clearance or looking at ratios of things like glucose. Um, this is something that takes multiple variables in that you know, the typical physician can't just do on their own. So examples of algorithms that the FDA would consider medical device um, would be something that has that integrates you know, quantitative results from multiple um, in vitro diagnostics to obtain a qualitative score. This could be something that either predicts the risk of developing a disease or condition or diagnosis in some way. Or a device that integrates um, various out, um, information about the patient, like their age, sex, genotype of multiple genes to, again, uh, predict the risk of diagnosis, uh, risk of diagnosis or um, the outcomes of a disease. So, um, our office reviews all PI-initiated studies that come to the Duke IRB, and we were noticing a lot of clinical investigations that included algorithms in some way. And so because of this, our office had a meeting with the FDA to ask them a few questions about algorithms to get their input. And so I have a summary here of some of the discussions that we had. <clears throat> so the FDA did agree that any calculation that would have multiple inputs and result in an output that would be used to assign a patient to a specific treatment regimen would be considered an algorithm, so something a little bit more than just um, a randomization scheme. We also asked about the, the format of the algorithm, because it makes sense that there's some kind of you know, computer program that's making this calculation, but what if that is in Excel format, or if it's just written on paper, um, and it's something, you know, it's within the protocol that you have to calculate. So the FG agreed that regardless of the format, those would all be considered algorithms and subject to the IDE regulations. And finally, we asked them about a, you know, a situation, like a scenario where the study was designed in a way that the, the calculation randomizes the patients to receive some sort of treatment, um, but that treatment would be within the label, um, and that the calculation formula is based on which treatment is assigned. Um, so for instance, if you were assigning patients to either get a high dose or a low dose of drug, but both of those would be within the approved label, um, the FDA said that that would still be considered an algorithm. Of course, in that situation, since it's on label, it's probably going to be non-significant risk. Um, but they did consider that an algorithm. Um, we have a question on HUD devices. Oh, okay. So 
Are there penalties or consequences for not submitting reports or not maintaining a regulatory binder for an HUD study at Duke? That is a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Best be a question for one of the IRB members who's uh, here in the audience today. Would anyone like to speak to this? <laughs> no comment. So, I mean, an HUD, I mean, that wouldn't be a clinical study. It is using a marketed device, so I'm not sure you would necessarily need, you know, a research binder for it. And does that make sense? I, I'm assuming you need to ensure you have the documentation that you got the IRB approval that is used, you know, appropriately. Yes, I would agree with that. Assuming that it's being used for clinical use and not in any type of research indication, I think that's a, a great response. Yeah. The question to that. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> thank you. We had a we got a comment that they've asked the IRB that exact question. Um, and the FDA doesn't care, but the IRB does, and they want you to maintain all those files. So maintain all the documentation. Be on the safe side. Okay. okay. All right, so just following up on the algorithms. Um, just like any medical device, the FDA um, regulates these based on risk um, and classifies them based on their intended use and the level of controls necessary to assure safety and effectiveness. <clears throat> so how they're used could dictate whether they would be, for instance, a class two or class three device. So an example here is if you have um, an algorithm that's um, intended to indicate a patient's risk of cancer occurrence, this could be viewed by the FDA as a class two device Whereas the same device, if it was predicting which patients receive chemotherapy, which is a little bit riskier, that could be considered a class three device. So to put this in context of a clinical investigation, that could be the difference between a non-significant risk study and a significant risk study, um, depending on how the algorithm is used. So it could be something that's very low risk that would maybe just need a abbreviated IDE, um, or it could be significant risk that would require an IDE. Next, mobile medical applications. So I'm sure most of you are very familiar with mobile applications. Probably have very, you know, a lot of them on your phone. So the, the FDA defines a mobile app as a software application that can be executed or run on a mobile platform or a web-based software application that's tailored to a mobile platform but is executed on the server. So there are situations where mobile apps could also fit within the definition of a medical device. So if they fit within that definition and they're either intended to be used in an accessory or a regulated medical device, accessory to a regulated medical device, or transform that mobile platform into a regulated medical device, um, FDA calls these mobile medical applications, or MMAs. So again, like all devices, FDA takes a risk-based approach to regulating mobile medical applications. So this diagram has, is a little schematic on how FDA views mobile apps in terms of their regulatory oversight. So at the bottom of the pyramid, you have um, mobile apps that are not medical devices. So they don't meet that definition of a medical device, even though it's, this could include things that are you know, healthcare related. At the other end of the spectrum, um, we have mobile medical apps that meet the definition of a medical device and are high risk. So these high-risk devices are the ones that FDA is most concerned with, and that's what they're going to focus their regulatory oversight on, so in terms of both commercialization and clinical investigations. Now, in between that, we have um, kind of a grayer area. Um, so these are mobile apps that may meet the definition of medical device, but are considered lower risk. And so FDA realizes there's lots of um, mobile apps that could meet the definition of medical device, but since they're low risk, it's not really worth their time and effort to um, highly regulate them at this time. So they're, 
um, they're using um, enforcement discretion, meaning that they're not going to enforce uh, marketing applications or the IDE regulations on devices that uh, fall into this middle category. So we're going to go through examples of what FDA would see falling into each of these categories. And I will say this is, there's a great guidance document on mobile medical applications that has um, a ton of examples. So if you're developing any um, mobile applications, I would suggest viewing the guidance document and looking at some of their examples to see how yours might compare. So the first set here, um, mobile apps that would not be considered medical devices. Again, it could be healthcare related. Um, so any mobile apps that have electronic copies of medical textbooks or other reference materials, um, not a medical device. Um, anything that's used as a, a training tool, um, even for medical training or just for patient education, not a medical device. Um, any apps that generate general office operations or generic aids or general uh, purpose products, not medical devices. The other end of the spectrum, um, mobile medical apps that do meet the definition of a uh, medical device and are higher risk. Uh, some examples of these are apps that are the extension of one or more medical devices by connecting to such devices for the purposes of controlling the device or for use in active patient monitoring or analyzing medical device data. So an example of this might be um, you know, some sort of handheld device that you could use for maybe like fetal monitoring, um, you know, something that the, the, the um, like a smartphone could help utilize using a medical device. Um, any app that transforms a mobile platform into a regular medical device by using attachments to display screen sensors um, or by including functionality similar to those of currently regulated medical devices um, that's considered higher risk um, and would be focus of their oversight. Or um, apps that become a medical device or software by performing patient-specific analysis and providing patient-specific diagnosis or treatment conditions. Um, so anything that could be used like for diagnosis at the bedside, um, that would be considered high risk and focus of their oversight. So these would be things that the FDA would require marketing applications for. It could be a 510K or PMA, depending on what kind of function uh, the app is doing. Um, and then they would also require the IDE app, the regulations to apply to these if it was uh, used in a clinical investigation. Now that middle category, enforcement discretion, Again, these are devices that may meet the definition of a medical device, but FDA isn't going to enforce um, marketing applications or the IDE regulations. So these are um, apps that could help patients self-manage diseases or conditions, but they don't provide uh, specific treatment or treatment suggestions. Um, if it's some sort of tool to help organize and track health information, if it helps patients um, document, show, or communicate medical conditions to their healthcare providers, so maybe an app that can take pictures of moles, um, or an app that can help you uh, interact with your um, medical information, so the MyChart app would fit into this category. Is there any questions on those? Okay. So wrapping up, we have a few um, practice questions. So question one, investigators running a multi-center trial in three out of four participating institutions. Um, the reviewing IRBs agree that with the investigator the device trial is a non-significant risk study. However, the fourth IRB sees it as a significant risk device study. What should you as the investigator do? Um, a, ignore the fourth IRB since the three others agreed. Go with the consensus. Uh, don't use the foresight, just get rid of them. <laughs> or alert the FDA of the significant risk determination within five days. Hearts <laughs> and C's. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> so that should be, you know, your first step would be notifying the FDA. You should also no notify those three other IRBs. They may want to take that into consideration. Maybe something that they overlooked. And it's really important because if any of these other sites are already enrolling subjects, they could be being treated with a significant risk device that. Um, would need some oversight. So then, you know, some of your next steps would be looking into, do you need an IDE? 
Um, and then kind of going back to what Kelly was talking about, you could do a um, risk determination um, and officially ask FDA if they see this as a non-significant risk or significant risk study because they will need to make the final determination. Or you can go ahead and actually submit an IDE um, and get that active with the FDA. So any questions about that? Okay. Question two. All the following IDE reports are required to be submitted to the FDA within five working days except withdrawal of IRB approval, an unanticipated adverse device effect, deviation from the investigational plan, or failure to obtain informed consent. So, anyway, A, B, B hands, C, D? No one has any guesses. So this is a really good question, I guess. Um, it's B. So remember, it's, it's 10 working days for an unanticipated adverse device effect. All the others are five days. Okay. Question three, a sponsor investigator is developing a novel device to enable ablation of epileptic loci in the brain by a surgical robot. The sponsor investigator has completed an early feasibility study in five patients with promising results. I would like to perform a larger feasibility study evaluating safety and efficacy endpoints in more subjects. The submission of this new clinical study protocol is best submitted as either A, original IDE application, B, report of the existing IDE, C, a supplement to the existing IDE, or D, an amendment to the existing IDE. I guess A, show of hands, B, C, C some C's, D. C is correct, a uh, supplement. Um, it will need prior approval, so, even though it's a, a new study. All right, the rest of our questions will be focused on the mobile medical applications and trying to determine which of those categories a specific app would fall into. So um, all of the questions will have one of these options. It'll either be a regulated MMA, so one of those high-risk devices, um, enforcement discretion, so a lower risk but may meet the definition of medical device, or it's not a medical device. All right, scenario one. Mobile apps that use GPS location information to alert asthmatics of environmental conditions that may cause asthma symptoms. When an MMA, enforcement discretion, no hands, not a medical device, a couple of those. It's enforcement discretion um, because it may meet the definition of a medical device. Scenario two, a mobile app which is a game that simulates various cardiac arrest scenarios to train health professionals in advanced CPR skills. So he thinks this would be high risk, regulated MMA, enforcement discretion, not a medical device. A few hands there, good. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a, it's a training tool. Um, it's not actually being used to help with the CPR, um, it's just training health professionals. Right, scenario three, an app which uses electrodes and sensors attached to a mobile platform to measure physiological parameters during CPR and provides feedback about the quality of CPR being delivered. Um, regulated MMA, hands, you enforcement discretion, not a medical device, so, you guys are right, it's a regulated MMA, so it is being used during the CPR, um, so that would be considered higher risk. So, mobile apps that use video and video games to motivate patients to do their physical therapy exercises at home. MMA, enforcement discretion, not a medical device, a few hands here and there. Um, be enforcement discretion um, because it could be a medical device if it's helping motivate them to complete their treatment um, for whatever exercises they need to do. All right. So I do have a few, um, so wrapping up, we have a few websites that can be really helpful if you're working on devices. Um, CDRH has a lot of different device-related courses that are online that you can look at. They have various different topics. Um, and their website is actually really helpful. So you can go to Device Advice um, and get more information about um, medical devices and IDEs. 
So if anyone has any questions about medical devices at any point, uh, please contact our office. We're here as a resource. We'd love to help you and talk to you. And please remember to fill out your evaluation form at the end. So if there's anybody, any other questions, I'm happy to take them. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you would, place your evaluation forms completed on the table outside where you signed in, if you will. Thank you.